By the mid-90s, the internet was starting to become more prevalent in the music business. You had Aerosmith in 1994 being the first major band to release a song on the web, and the same year you had Megadeth, who was the first band to make a website. It's funny that these two bands were pioneers in the internet because they had toured the previous year and it resulted in Aerosmith firing Megadeth after only several dates. In fact, I've done a whole video on the topic, the link is down below. In the subsequent years, we saw artists speaking to fans online and by 1997, song leaks became more and more common as bits and pieces of U2's upcoming album Pop leaked online. It was the same year that Oasis was trying to stamp out fan sites which posted their songs, their lyrics, as well as photos of the group. Prior to Napster's birth, you could download songs online but it was a pretty tedious and frustrating process. By 1999, record labels were still selling millions and millions of albums on compact discs, and it was a great model for record labels and artists. If you liked one song by a band, you'd have to go buy their full CD, and that's how groups like Chamba Wamba sold millions of records. But that was about to change. Napster's beginnings can be traced back to Sean Fanning, who in just a few short years was about to change the music business permanently. His stepfather was a delivery driver and his mother was a nurse's aide. Growing up in Brockton, Massachusetts, he had four younger siblings and at one point his parents split up and it resulted in him and his siblings living in foster care for about a six month period. His parents would eventually reconcile and he would attend high school in Cape Cod. Fanning wasn't your typical computer nerd. He was also an incredible athlete batting a whopping 750 as a shortstop on his state championship winning team, but that was about to change. In 1997, he received a gift from his uncle, his first computer. He soon gave up all his extracurricular sports activities and put all his energy into learning about software development and soon taught himself how to code. He'd also start hanging out in chat rooms frequented by hackers, including the IRC or Internet Relay Chat, and would talk about security vulnerabilities on the internet. It was there he met another teenager from Virginia named Sean Parker. By the fall of 1998, Fanning would end up attending Northeastern University in Boston, but his computer science classes weren't challenging enough and he soon looked to distract himself. It would be his roommates that led him down a rabbit hole that eventually led to Napster, with Fanning telling Spin, My roommates were MP3 fanatics. I heard them complaining all the time about how hard it was to find songs using search engines. Fanning soon put his energy into figuring out a way to make accessing music free and easy online. Some sometimes spending 48 to 72 hours straight writing code. Fanning not only thought his idea could be big, but he was worried that somebody might beat him to the punch. He would recall to Time Magazine, I had this idea that there was a lot of material out there sitting on people's hard drives. I mean, even if you were a search engine website like Lycos or Scour, you were still looking at people's hard drives. So that's the idea, that there's all this stuff sitting on people's PCs, and I had to figure out a way to go and get it. On a night in January of 1999, Fanning was going back to campus with his cousin. When his cousin pulled up to his dormitory, Fanning got out and began walking to his door, only to turn around and go up to his cousin and tell him, and I quote, I'm not going back to school. Fanning would leave all his possessions, except his computer of course, in his dorm and didn't bother telling his roommates the news. His parents, however, would find out and flipped out on him repeatedly, telling him how he would get nowhere without an education. Fanning soon moved into his uncle's office, a computer gaming company, to continue work on this project which ultimately became Napster. But he had a lot of detractors, including some of those people he met on the IRC chat rooms. They consistently told him that people would never want to share music, let alone share the contents of their hard drives but Fanning disagreed. Fanning by this point in time didn't have all the skills to create Napster at first. He soon purchased a book on graphic interfaces and was able to enlist the help of a few other computer friends including Parker as well as another programmer named Jordan Ritter and they put out the first incarnation of Napster on June 1st of 1999. The name would take its inspiration from a nickname Fanning got from a friend who told him his hair wasn't I quote nappy. He used Napster as his IRC chat name as well. Napster would make finding music simple and free. A few keystrokes and mouse clicks and you could literally find any song you wanted. Here's a blast from the past from CBC News explaining how Napster works. Here's how it works. When someone in Toronto loads the Napster software, it connects with a computer in California. 
when a user types in a request for a particular song, the computers in California go to work, sorting through the thousands of file listings, coming up with a list of computers that might have a copy of the requested song. Napster might find that specific request on a computer in Vancouver. But when the user in Toronto goes to download it, Napster steps out of the picture. The actual file download takes place between the two users. Napster only facilitates the transfer. Still, this lawyer says in U.S. law, helping people violate copyright law is considered an offense. Providing a service that people may use to infringe is one thing, but when you're actively involved in assisting them in doing it, you're just begging for this kind of action to be brought against you. Almost overnight, the service had 40,000 users, and soon enough, millions of songs were being shared by them. Napster's popularity would spread like wildfire, with the media shining the spotlight on the program, along with word of mouth, and at its peak, Napster was said to be used by 40 to 80 million people. Napster seemed to hit at the perfect time as the widespread availability of the internet with CD burning technology gave millions the ability to upload their music collections to the program. It wasn't just official recordings appearing on Napster, as soon the service also included live recordings, demos, and sometimes unreleased material, and of course mislabeled songs. A good chunk of Napster's user base largely hailed from college campuses since they had access to high-speed internet. In fact, Napster grew so big by the early 2000s that some college campuses considered banning the service because it was taking up too much bandwidth. Indiana University claimed that in November of 1999, Napster usage took up 10% of their bandwidth, while by January of 2000, it rose to 50%. Usage shot past 60% once the university announced they would be banning the service from campus. But the students would fight back against these types of Napster bans with some mixed results. Even overseas, Napster was hugely popular. In England at Oxford, with so much Napster use, the university was shelling out a lot of money with a graduate student telling Spin Magazine, Oxford gets charged per byte for transatlantic network use, so it actually would have been less expensive to buy the students the CDs themselves. Spin would report that Napster usage was also prevalent in both the public and private sector. The magazine would report that Napster usage was significant at Dell Computer's tech support department, and even Napster programmers revealed that they traced its usage to the Department of Defense. Here's a great MTV story about Napster, talking about the program's popularity. What's up, man? I'm with uh, MTV News. Um, I was wondering if you had any MP3s on your computer. Yeah. So, uh, how many MP3s do you have on your computer? About 600. Maybe like 100 or something? Uh, six or 7,000. Come again? Six or seven thousand. For real? Yeah. They're all legit. Uh, how many MP3s do you have on your computer? Uh, probably like 300. For real? Where'd you get them from? Uh, truthfully, most of them from Napster. I gotta say, I was a little surprised today to see the extent to which kids have been using MP3s. You know, four, five, six hundred MP3s on their computer. It's, uh, it's pretty enormous, and that means a lot of royalty checks that a lot of artists are missing out. There's three guys that have a burner here on our floor, and we'll just download songs, and then we'll uh, pick a list and make it, and then we'll go make party song like party discs or CDs, and we'll just uh, make them ourselves. We don't really go out and buy them after that. Are you a pirate? Well, I don't know. My roommate does the whole computer thing. Margaret, are you a pirate? I don't know. So, depends on the artist, like, on whether or not I feel guilty. Like, what do you mean? Well, like, for example, if for some reason I needed a Blink-182 MP3, I wouldn't lose any sleep over ripping off them for royalties. It was shortly after Napster took off that Fanning's uncle set up a meeting with a venture capitalist named Eileen Richardson, who had previously provided seed money to numerous tech startups. Napster now had its first investor, and Richardson became the company's CEO when it relocated from Massachusetts to California. Napster in 2000 became the fastest growing website on the internet, and despite not making any money, the company was flush with cash, getting millions from investors. Fanning, for his part, took a modest five-figure salary, and the company expanded to around 50 employees. Fanning, for his part, had a 9% stake in the company, but it was mostly worthless. He would, however, become a rock star, gracing the cover of Fortune, Business Week, and Forbes, as well as Time Magazine, and Time would report that even Nike offered him a shoe deal. Of course, one thing that was overlooked by the people who worked for Napster, as well as its investors, and the people who were using the program, was that they didn't seem to think about the legal ramifications. 
Some copyright holders were not happy about their content appearing on the service. They hadn't given their permission for the content to be shared. And secondly, they weren't being compensated since Napster didn't have a business model yet for making money. Something that was largely underreported at the time was that in late 1999, 18 different record labels sued Napster, with A&M being the main plaintiff in the case. The lawsuit would set a precedent for what was to come the next year when Metallica and Dr. Dre filed their own lawsuits against Napster. Napster wasn't the first time that the music industry attempted to protect their copyrights. The labels, publishers, and songwriters have long grappled with piracy, trying to control concert CDs and cassette tape bootleggers from recording their shows and albums. You guys might remember those messages on the back of cassette tapes that read, home taping is killing music. While bootleggers probably had a small impact on music sales back then, the impact of Napster would prove to be much bigger than any band or label or publisher could control. The record label's lawsuits against Napster sought $100,000 in damages for each time the company infringed on copyrights, which would have amounted to millions and millions of dollars, as the labels contended in their lawsuit that they owned 70% of Napster's song library. With so much at stake, Napster hired their own big gun lawyer, David Boyce, who led the US government's antitrust case against Microsoft. Attorneys for the record industry would subpoena emails and documents from Napster, as well as Fanning's uncle and the company's early employees. According to Time Magazine, the record labels alleged that Napster was guilty of tributary copyright infringement. So while Napster didn't commit copyright infringement themselves because they didn't house the songs in a central location, they aided and embedded copyright infringement by their users. Remember the news report of how Napster fined songs for users? Well, the labels claim that by doing so, Napster was aiding and embedding in copyright infringement. Some legal observers put Napster's chances of winning at 50-50, while others said Napster didn't have a leg to stand on. It was uncharted territory for the legal system. Napster, for their part, seemed to have numerous defenses, and when one failed, they took up another one. But one by one, they fell as courts repeatedly ruled against the music sharing service. Napster initially claimed they were protected by, and I'm not kidding you guys, fair use doctrine that allows the use of copyrighted material without permission of the copyright holders for limited purposes. Now, fair use varies on a case-by-case -case basis, and courts typically look at four factors. The purpose of use, the nature of work being used, the amount of work used, and the effect on the use of market for or the value of the original work. And the last one is really where the record labels claim they were hurt financially by Napster. The courts would end up ruling against Napster's defense claiming they were not protected by fair use. While copyright holders could issue takedown requests to Napster, it wouldn't be an easy process. On top of that, the content would frequently reappear on the service pretty quickly, and the copyright holders would have to go through the same process again. Napster's attorney claimed that using the program was no different than using a VCR to record your favorite movie or TV show, or using a photocopier to copy pages out of a book, both of which are legal. In fact, there was a landmark case between Universal, who sued Sony in 1984, in an attempt to stop Sony from selling Betamax because the devices could be used for copyright infringement. Ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled in Sony's favor because Betamax's and later on VCR's primary use was not to infringe on copyright. The same couldn't be said for Napster as the company would have to prove the chief use of its program didn't involve copyright infringement, something they couldn't do. Napster also claimed they had protection from the 1992 Audio Home Recording Act, which permits copying audio recordings for personal use provided they don't make a profit. The law didn't make a distinction between small-scale and large-scale recording, but again the courts disagreed. Napster would also go on to claim that they didn't house the MB3 files themselves, but rather connected people who shared content. The company would also warn users that they shouldn't be trading copyrighted material. Napster's other defense was that they were protected under the 1998 DMCA or Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which shields companies from being responsible for what their users post or do, similar to how internet service providers or even social media companies get out of responsibility today. While a judge would rule that Napster couldn't use the DMCA to protect itself as it didn't meet all of the criteria. The record labels contended that Napster was stealing and hurting record sales, but the facts didn't prove that. CD sales during the Napster era actually increased by $500 million, according to Time Magazine. Napster's PR team even pointed out that they had studies which showed that the average Napster user purchased more music than people who didn't use the program. 
but it did little to change the record label's mind. In fact, the record labels pointed to a sound scan study that showed declining CD sales at stores near universities, which they claim proved that Napster was hurting the music business. The media, for their part, didn't really latch on to the whole Napster copyright issue until Metallica entered the ring. In the summer of 1999, Metallica was in the studio working on the song I Disappear for the Mission Impossible 2 soundtrack. The plan was to put out the song the following year to coincide with the release of the film, and Metallica was surprised to learn that an unfinished version of the song leaked onto Napster and soon found its way onto 20 radio stations across the states. In 2017, drummer Lars Ulrich would look back and reveal what was going on with Metallica at the time, saying, We recorded it in between some touring commitments and it was going to be held back till the next summer. And so one day I got a call from Cliff Bernstein saying, I disappear is being played on 20 radio stations across America. And we're like, how the f is this possible? And he just said, there's something called Napster where people can go and share. And we're like, how the hell do they get I disappear? It lives in our vault somewhere. Upon investigating what happened, the band discovered the leak originated from Napster. On April 13, 2000, Metallica filed a lawsuit against the company, claiming they were guilty of copyright infringement and racketeering. The band was soon joined by Dr. Dre, who filed his own lawsuit, and Metallica would seek $10 million in damages from the company, and also named in Metallica's lawsuit were three universities, including the University of South Carolina, Yale University, and Indiana University, claiming that the three schools did nothing to limit access to Napster on their networks. Here's Lars on 60 Minutes explaining his issue with Napster. He says that what's at stake is nothing less than the future of his business. I did not, was not asked if I wanted to be part of Napster. I was not asked if Napster could throw our music into their system. That choice was taken away from me. This is not about now. No, this is about five years from now. This is about 10 years from now. So if we are going to sell our music on the internet in whatever way we so choose, we cannot do that if the guy next door is giving it away for free. The three universities would eventually be dropped from the lawsuit after they agreed to block access to the file sharing program. Metallica soon faced backlash from their fans who accused the band of being hypocrites and greedy rock stars. If you guys remember, Metallica had long encouraged their fans to bootleg their concerts, even having a special area of the venue for bootleggers. On top of that, the band's rise in popularity in the early 80s was a result of their cassette demo tape, No Life to Leather, that the band gave out for free and encouraged fans to bootleg. It was said to be amongst the most traded demo tapes in rock history. Metallica soon went from being seen as an anti-establishment band to being corporate fat cats in some fans' eyes. Even longtime supporters of the band, LA radio station KNAC, would tell the New York Times in 2000, there are going to be Metallica CD burnings if they try this. They're the number one fan of George Washington, referring to the president on the $1 bill. They're just being the man, they would add. Metallica not only got blowback from their fans, but also other musicians, including Motley Crue, who had already feuded with Lars a few years back. Bassist Nikki Six would tell MTV at the time, Pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered, and I think Metallica's hogs. They make enough off t-shirts and concert events and other forms of corporation. I think that is not acceptable behavior for an artist to do that to their fans. Metallica soon faced ridicule online, in viral videos, and even the show South Park spoofed them as well. The band even got slammed by longtime fan Dave Grohl, as he told Dennis Miller here. I thought that Lars guy was taking a big dangerous step. Now you got to admire him for falling on his, his heart, but well, you it's know a what? pretty dangerous step to disconnect from those kids. I think that the thing about music is that music should be available to anybody that wants to hear it. But I don't want to turn on radio and have to put a nickel in it to hear. Metallica would end up hiring a British consulting firm to monitor Napster over a weekend in April of 2000. The firm delivered to the band a list of users who were involved in downloading and distributing the band's music. The list included more than 350,000 users with the song Nothing Else Matters being the most downloaded track on Napster service, with 116,574 copies being posted by almost 74,000 users. The San Francisco Gate would report that on May 3, 2000, Lars Ulrich famously showed up at Napster's California headquarters in a chauffeured Chevy Blazer, 
with two attorneys and two more document roadies who brought in 13 boxes with over 60,000 pages of documents which contained the usernames of those 350,000 users. On hand during the visit were dozens of media cameras and journalists as well as some of the band's detractors. Here's some of what Lars had to say at the press conference and one fan even got into it with Lars as you can see here. And this is not about Metallica and its fans, this is about Metallica and yeah, Napster. Yeah. And uh, so that's why we are doing this. This is not about Metallica's fans. We have a wonderful relationship with most of them and this is about Metallica and Napster. Let there be no question about that. There you go. A lot of Metallica fans. We are sending a message to our fans that um, we have no issues with the internet. We look at the internet to the future as a great way to get uh, Metallica music directed to our fans. But this is a clear uh, illegal thing and um, that people should know that. And um, if they want to steal Metallica's music instead of hiding behind their computers, in their bedrooms and dorm rooms then just go down to Tower Records and grab them off the shelves instead and not be pussies about it. So, um... What about the people that have the records? Are you suggesting, just down are you more suggesting that people go to Tower Records and steal records? I'm not suggesting that. I'm trying to basically come up with the analogy that what they're doing is the same thing. That there really is no difference whether you're stealing it over the internet or stealing it from a record store. There is. Yeah, from a criminal point of view, no clear difference. Soon after I got to listen to your music and buy the CD. Right, anybody have any questions? Lars, how much? But how much once again, understand. Once again, understand that if Napster had come to us and wanted to play ball with us and we were open to that. Nobody asked us Not our permission, nobody asked us what our thoughts on this were. The issue is not whether you get Metallica music through the internet. The issue is that Napster is providing a service that give people the opportunity to steal our music. Have you ever personally used Napster before? I've never been on the website. I can barely get onto AOL. I need you, help. Spin Magazine reported that one person held a sign that read RIAA equals Master of Puppets, and it was during Lars' statement he gave to the press he was heckled by one angry Metallica fan who shouted, Long Love Napster, and we want to just hear the music. Another person held up a dollar bill asking Lars to sing him a song, but there was one lone Metallica supporter who told Spin, if someone makes something, no one has the right to give it away without consent. At one point during the news conference, Lars debated with a Napster fan named Tony who destroyed his collection of Metallica CDs and tossed them. Ulrich would end up heading into the building telling Napster employees it was nothing personal, and within a week the company would ban those 350,000 users. Under the DMCA, users could protest being kicked off Napster service, of which 30,000 did, and in return Metallica had 10 days to take legal action against the users, otherwise they would be allowed back onto the service. Other users found a workaround just by creating new usernames. But funny enough, Spin would report that by June of 2000, Metallica's music was still available on the service, including I Disappear. By July of 2000, Lars would appear in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee on the future of digital music. Lars would sit just a few feet away from Sean Fanning and protested what Napster was doing, as you can see here. Napster hijacked our music without asking. They never sought our permission. Our catalog of music simply became available for free downloads on the Napster system. I do not have a problem with any artist voluntarily distributing his or her songs through any means that artist so chooses. But just like a carpenter who crafts a table gets to decide whether he wants to keep it, sell it, or give it away, shouldn't we have the same options? We should decide what happens to our music, not a company with no rights in our recordings, which has never invested a penny in our music or had anything to do with its creation. The choice has been taken away from us. With Napster, every song by every artist is available for download at no cost, and of course with no payment to the artist, the songwriter, or the copyright holder. If you're not fortunate enough to own a computer, there's only one way to assemble a music collection, the equivalent of a Napster user. Theft. Walk into a record store, grab what you want, and walk out. The difference is that the familiar phrase, files done, is now replaced by another familiar phrase, you're under arrest. 
Since what I do is make music, let's talk about the recording artist for a moment. When Metallica makes an album, we spend many months and many hundreds of thousands of our own dollars writing and recording. We typically employ a record producer, recording engineers, programmers, assistants, and occasionally other musicians. We rent time for months at recording studios which are owned by small businessmen who have risked their own capital to buy, maintain, and constantly upgrade very expensive equipment and facilities. Our record releases are supported by hundreds of record companies, employees, and provide programming for numerous radio and television stations. Add it all up and you have an industry with many jobs, a few glamorous ones like ours, and lots more covering all levels of the pay scale and providing wages which support families and could contribute to our economy. Remember too that my band Metallica is fortunate enough to make a great living from what we do. Most artists are barely earning a decent wage and need every source of revenue available to scrape by. Also keep in mind that the primary source of income for most songwriters is from the sale of records. Every time a Napster enthusiast downloads a song, it takes money from the pockets of all these members of the creative community. It is clear then that if music is free for downloading, the music industry is not viable. All the jobs I just talked about will be lost and the diverse voices of the artists will disappear. The argument I hear a lot that music should be free must then mean that musicians should work for free. Nobody else works for free. Why should musicians? Fast forward to September of 2000 at the MTV Video Music Awards, and either as a way to troll Metallica or drum up a lot of eyeballs, both Metallica and Sean Fanning were in attendance. That night, Metallica would perform I Disappear with some in the audience booing the band. Fanning would come out on stage alongside Carson Daly to introduce Britney Spears and trolled Lars, as you can see here. ...that has revolutionized the way we all get our music, and he is here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, creative Napster, Sean Fanning. Nice shirt. Nice shirt. You like it? You like it? Yeah. Actually, a friend of mine shared it with me. I'm uh, thinking about getting my own, though. All right. I think we need to uh, get on with this introduction as quickly as possible. Yo, the sooner I can get off the stage, the better. Yeah. You and me both. <laughs> uh, she's already sold millions of albums and sold out auditoriums all over the world. Here to sing a song older than she... But strangely enough, at the same show, Lars appeared in a bizarre anti-piracy skit with Marlon Wayans to speak out against Napster. <laughs> What the hell do you think you're doing, man? Holy crap! Do you know who you are? You're freaking Lars on from Metallica! I love everything you do! Except for that bad show you hosted. You know what? Maybe I wouldn't have to whore myself out if you kids didn't steal my music. Uh, whoa. We're not stealing, okay? We're just sharing with each other, you know? So it's like if I take this soda can right here, take a sip out of it. Oh. I'm sharing my soda with Lars Ulrich. <laughs> and you know what? I'm just sharing 10 years of groupies with you, frat boy. <laughs> I'm starting to like this whole sharing thing. Hey, boys! Oh, hey, Bobby! Some crazy Brody's just stole my car. Not the Pinto! Napster. Sharing's only fun when it's not your stuff. In March of 2001, Napster would be ordered by a judge to shut down their service until they could guarantee that no copyrighted content could be downloaded. The company would come up with a filter that could stop about 99.4% of the copyrighted content from appearing on the service, and by the summer of 2001, Napster was ordered to remain shut down. Napster would eventually settle their lawsuit with Metallica and Dr. Dre in July of 2001. After a series of setbacks, Napster would officially end their free file sharing service in July of 2001, and in September, Napster would settle with the record labels and the music publishers, paying out $26 million. As part of the settlement, $16 million was just for past damages, while $10 million was in advance for future royalties when Napster would relaunch as a new secure and paid service. But Napster's peak usage happened in February 2001, and from that point onwards, their users flocked to other file sharing services. In 2002, Napster would announce that it had filed for bankruptcy and sold its assets to a third party. 
In 2009, Lars would appear on Eddie I Know Everybody Trunk's show, that metal show on VH1 Classic, and revealed he illegally downloaded the band's latest release at the time, 2008's Death Magnetic, revealing, I sat there myself and downloaded Death Magnetic from the internet just to try it. I was like, wow, this is how it works. I figured if there's anybody that has the right to download Death Magnetic for free, it's me. I sat there one night in my house with about six of my friends and a bottle of wine, we found it. There was like two or three days after Death Magnetic leaked. I was like, you know what? I got to try this. So we sat there and 30 minutes later, I had Death Magnetic in my computer. It was kind of bizarre. It was after Napster announced its bankruptcy. It was acquired by a company named Roxio for $5 million. And soon enough, Best Buy purchased Napster by the end of the decade, but they also faltered with the service. Over the past several years, it's been bought and sold by a few investment firms. And while it's debatable whether streaming services have actually cut down on music piracy, the irony is that Napster compensates artists better than most other popular streaming services, despite not being as popular with only a 1.75% market share. Lars would admit that the publicity stunt of him showing up to Napster's office probably wasn't a great idea in hindsight, and told 92Y in New York, I think we could have educated ourselves better about what the other side were thinking and what the real issues were. Ulrich would admit that him and Sean Parker are now friends and would appear together at an event to promote the band's back catalog appearing on Spotify in 2012. As to what happened to Sean Fanning, he would be involved in several new startups, most notably Rupture, a social media networking site for gamers that was eventually acquired by Electronic Arts for $30 million. Well, that was a fun blast from the past, guys. Let me know if you guys used Napster back in the day. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to like button and subscribe. And we'll see you again in Rock Country Story Sticker.